The question says, an iron nucleus undergoes an elastic collision with a stationary uranium nucleus. So uh, for the purpose of setting up the questions, really, all the nuclear stuff, I don't really care uh, what matters is you have two masses that are colliding. So you have a target mass. Uh, oops, why is that so thick? Um, you have a target mass. Let me use capital M for that. And you have an incoming mass. Let me use a lowercase m for uh, the, yeah, without the driver, it's a little bit awkward. Uh, you have lowercase m. And after the collision, it says, um, well, it undergoes an elastic collision. And it simply asks, what percent of the kinetic energy of the iron nucleus is transferred to the uranium nucleus? Mm. Assume the collision is head-on, one-dimensional. That does make it easier. It doesn't give you any more information than that. I think if you have some intuition of the type that you might have built up in one of the labs, it, you might have this intuition that uh, if this was before the collision, then the picture you should have uh, after the collision will look like where the, so looking at these mass numbers, iron nucleus is lighter or it's less massive than the uranium nucleus. So this colliding object is smaller in mass. And you might have this intuition that in a collision like that, the smaller mass bounces back. If you have that intuition, great. That is correct. Now, um, what it is is even if that were incorrect, um, there is a way to kind of correct it after you work out all the math. So you might still assume a direction anyway. So, um, so kind of thinking through this collision, uh, you might get this first. So you have some um, thing with the initial velocity coming in, striking, and then after the collision, the target mass goes off um, probably forward to the right. And if you have correct intuition, you realize the incoming mass will bounce back backward to the left uh, because um, M is lighter than big M. No. If you don't have that, great, it's fine. You can still move on without getting this part necessarily right. But this kind of diagram is useful for kind of getting a full sense of what's going on physically in this setup. And after you kind of work it through, then um, the thing is to go through the solution steps. And if you, I think by this point, you are probably familiar with the conservation laws. So you would set up conservation of energy, conservation of momentum equations, and try to solve it. And my guess is um, a lot of people might get stuck at these steps. Like you write, wrote down a bunch of equations, and then um, you can't quite solve it algebraically. You keep getting stuck when you try different things. So that's what the hint uh, that I give is meant to address. And uh, I think I tried to give as much hint as I could without giving away the answer. Um, but in conversation with your study group leader, I realized, oh, maybe that's not enough. Because it took me a little bit of time to work it back out. <laughs> so, so that's why I want you to go over this question here so that um, so that I can kind of show you how carefully you have to work through these steps. And I guess the first few times you're going through questions like this, one most important thing probably is the willingness to go back in steps. Kind of realize you're in a dead end, scratch out whatever it is you're doing, and kind of try a different route that you haven't tried it before. So uh, let me follow this uh, advice here. It says start by setting up the conservation law equation. Yeah, I think it, I was going to do that. So let me do a uh, conservation of energy. It's an elastic collision. That is the one thing that you are given. So which means um, the, the initial kinetic energy of the colliding mass, K naught, that can only go into kinetic energy of the two outgoing masses. So um, um, so key e, kinetic energy one plus 
kinetic energy too. All right, that's one conservation law. And because it's collision, you know there's a conservation of momentum involved, usually, probably. So let me write that down. So conservation of momentum. And in physics 4A, I like to write my equations in a way that every symbol I write down is a positive number. So that's why I'm going to write it this way. I'm gonna, for conservation of momentum, I'm going to say the incoming momentum, oops, not PE, it's just a P, um, incoming momentum. I could have put a vector symbol, but it's 1D. I can just deal with the directions in science, and that's what I'm doing here. Is equal to, I'm going to say minus P1 to indicate um, momentum P1 going to the left in the negative direction. And it doesn't have to be written this way. I'm just writing it this way so that when I work out my P1, if I do, it's going to be a positive number. And um, at some point, I think at higher levels of math engineering and uh, physics, you eventually kind of allow your variables to be negative. But at this uh, point in your career, I think it's better for you to put the science into your equation so that you are consciously thinking about the science of your quantities. So uh, yeah, so the initial momentum is equal to the minus P1 for the P1 that's going to left plus P2 for the momentum of the big mass M, P2 that's going to the right. So, so those are my two conservation law equations. And um, this is basically full of unknowns. So um, I'm gonna have to start substituting in other expressions. And that's where uh, I have additional hint to follow. It says, for the masses of the particles use that, uh, um, yeah, um, no. that's something you can do if you are actually plugging in numbers. Uh, uh, here, <laughs> and I think this is where I was trying to give a hint and I think it ended up not being quiet enough. So it says, one idea to possibly simplify algebra, express conservation laws in terms of instant and outgoing particles, kinetic energies rather than speed. And I think maybe some hint of that is here in that the questions being asked, oh, in that the questions being asked, they are not, um, well, they're not in terms of velocities or speed, it's in terms of percent of kinetic energy. So if you have these quantities already expressed in terms of kinetic energy, it's probably gonna be easier to work it out. So, um, so and there's other reasons too, but um, we did that as enough of a motivation. Let me um, follow that advice here. And what I want you to illustrate is how to follow that advice. The last hint is, you know, if you can't work out the algebra, then just to do it the easy way, the brute force way. But I won't, hopefully I won't have to uh, resort to that. <laughs> so um, the first equation here is already in terms of uh, kinetic energies. So I don't think I need to do anything with that. So let me just label the equation one. I have equation two, which is in terms of momenta and, um, and that's not very helpful. So this is where you have to remember the relationship between momentum and kinetic energy. You should remember that, well, kinetic energy, which you can express as one half mv squared, and you have been, it can actually be expressed in terms of momentum as momentum squared over 2m. You can kind of prove this for yourself using momentum is equal to mv. So what I need to do is to solve this uh, kind of mini equation for the momentum. And when you do, you get momentum is equal to square root of two times m times the kinetic energy. So that's what I'm gonna use. And when you do square root like this, I think that's where it does benefit you when you write your equations this way. So otherwise you have to do, go through other mental gymnastics or whatever to remember all the signs. If you are writing your equations from the start in a way where your variables are positives, then that kind of does take care of a lot of things. So let me write it this way here. The initial momentum can be written in terms of the initial kinetic energy. 
So that's going to be square root of and the method incoming thing is the lowercase m, 2m times initial kinetic energy is equal to minus, <laughs> remembering the minus sign there, times the square root of uh, mass is still the same, lowercase m mass, 2m. And for kinetic energy, I don't have k not 0, I have k1. So k e 1. And then I need the last term here, plus uh, momentum of um, big mass m. So it's a square root of 2 times the capital M times the kinetic energy 2. All right. Now, if you look at this carefully, um, you will see that you still have too many unknowns. You have, well, the incident kinetic energy is unknown. The outgoing kinetic energies are technically unknown. So you have three unknowns, two equations. That's not quite enough. Um, there's a couple different ways you can handle that. One is to kind of, um, I guess maybe, let me put it this way. So the question, it never asks you for the energies directly. It's asking for percent of kinetic energy. So you can kind of think of expressing this in terms of ratios. So um, you, with the equation one, I can do that by just dividing through by Ke naught. When I do that, the left-hand side becomes one, this is Ke1 over Ke0, Ke2 over Ke0. So this is one of my unknowns, x. This is other of my unknowns, let's say y. And um, you will see that that's a kind of a, a manipulation that you can do for both of my equations. Um, in, the, in my second equation too, I can do similar division divided by square root of k naught. When I do that, this k naught goes away and I have under square root k1 divided by k naught and um, second term under square root k2 divided by k naught. So you say, uh, so let me just use those labels. I'll call this x, call this y, and basically my task is to solve for the unknowns x and y. And um, once you have x and or y, then you can see how that relates to this percent of kinetic energy transferred and um, you can do it that way. So let me write down the cleaned up equations here. Equation one is one is equal to x plus y. And equation two is um, square root of 2m is equal to minus the square root of 2m times square root of x plus square root of 2 big M times square root of y. So at this point, you have two equations, two unknowns. It should be solvable. And that's a good thing to know before you start because um, these square roots are going to going to make your life difficult. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, you have to be prepared for that. And I'm not entirely sure if I remember all the solution steps. <laughs> Went through this with uh, your study group leader and I still need to kind of think this through to remember. Uh, let me do one more simplification because I don't want to deal with the uh, extraneous um, symbols that I don't need to deal with. I say that if I divide this through by square root of 2m, lowercase m, that kind of simplifies two of the terms. It uh, you know, makes this one, makes this minus one, and it makes this one ratio of masses. It's gonna be square root of big M over small m. So, um, you know, it's just fewer things to write. I think it's gonna be better. Um, all right, so I have two equations, uh, which are, just reminding myself, <laughs> one is equal to x plus y, and the second one is now one is equal to minus the square root of x um, plus 
square root of big M over small m square root of y. Um, and there are many different things you can do at this stage that'll kind of lead you into that end. And um, when you've struggled to log enough with the problems like this, you will eventually realize that um, what's giving you all this trouble are these square roots. So what if I didn't have those square roots? So let me just to focus on that. I'm going to try to get rid of square roots first. And then I'll see what I can simplify and I'll move on from there. So I um, guess one thing to uh, one thing I can try to get rid of a square root is hmm, what do I want to do? <laughs> I don't remember all the steps. I may be trying this a couple different ways. Let me just uh, try taking this and just squaring the whole thing. Uh, by the way, I'm not using substitution with uh, this particularly because this is what makes the algebra here complicated. Uh, substitution may work, but I think sometimes, especially problems like this, ones that involve square roots or squares, that um, sometimes substitution kind of leads you down a path where it's not clear how you get out of it. So I'm squaring, squaring, I get expression one is equal to square of this is plus um, square root squared, so just x. And then let me just do this term squared. That's going to be plus uh, the ratio big M over small m uh, times y. And then there are things that we call cross terms, uh, which if you go through it, it's going to end up being minus 2 times the square root of big M over small m times um, square root of x, y. I'm still left with the square root. That's a bit disappointing. Oh, but one thing I can do is I can, um, I, I, so I see one way to kind of simplify, you know, using this equation here and this equation here, I see a way to kind of simplify because they share some of the terms. So if I do a linear combination, I will cancel, be canceling out some of the terms and, uh, and I'll deal with whatever expression remains. Let me label this equation three. Oh, and I guess this is the one. So what I'm doing is um, equation three minus one. And when you do that, left-hand side becomes zero equal to Excess cancel out, and this that one does. And I have this uh, big M over small m y minus y. So factoring out y, I'm going to get uh, big M over m minus 1 times y minus 2 times the square root of big M over m um, square root of x, y. Hmm, I still have two unknowns. That's a bummer. Hmm. Oh, uh, let me see. No, it doesn't quite do it. Um, hmm. Well, I, I think um, one thing that's good to try in situations like this is to try to isolate the square root. That's because uh, um, I'm kind of on an autopilot here right now. And I'm thinking, all right, I have this complex expression. What do I do? Well, I know this is one of my unknowns and I know one way so one of the things that's complicating is this square root. And the standard way to get rid of square root is you isolate the square root term, which is this one, put it by itself, and then you square everything. That will get rid of the square root. So let's do that and see where that gets us. So when you do that, 
So I'm gonna solve it for this square root of x, y. Um, so let me just write it by itself, square root of x, y for when I have solved for it. That's gonna be equal to, so I guess I'm imagining I move this to the left-hand side and then I'm multiplying through by um, one half times square root of small m over big M. Yeah, that will get rid of all the coefficients. And I still have this term here, which is um, big M over small m minus one um, times y. All right, squaring uh, both sides, I get x times y is equal to uh, one half squared, so one fourth. Uh, square of those ratios, so small m over big M, and this thing in parentheses squared um, times y squared. Oh, one factor of y cancels. So I have this y canceling that y. So I have x, it, uh, kind of a simple relationship between x and y. And this is a kind of a no-no when you are solving system of equations. Um, it's, as a general rule, I try to avoid it. But here, I'm just gonna be in a watchful fashion. I'm going to use this equation one more time. Uh, normally, you want to avoid doing that because that's how you get dependent the system of equations. But here, uh, you know, I'm just uh, trying things out. And if I get dependent the system of equation, what it'll end up giving me is like one equals one. When I get that, I'll know I messed up. I have to go back and redo this. <laughs> but I'm kind of crossing my fingers, hoping I don't get that. So let me see what I want to solve for. Uh, kind of looking back. Um, so the way X and Y were defined, what percent of kinetic energy is transferred to the target particle? Oh, I think that's more directly related to Y because it's the kinetic energy of the target particle over the initial energy. So that gives you the percent that you're looking for. So, um, so let me, um, so out of the equations one and four, let me solve for Y eliminating x. So what that actually means is um, I, um, oh, this is already solved for x. So let me plug this into here and plug equation four into one and then try to solve it for y. So, uh, so plugging equation four into one, I get one is equal to the x, which is this expression here, one fourth. And uh, let me try to simplify this a little bit here. Um, can I? Now since it's complicated, let me not. Uh, small m over big M, big M over small m minus one squared times y, that is um, that. Um, plus y, um, okay, I can factor out y. So uh, when I factor out y, it becomes one fourth. Uh, it, I'm not, it might be worth the kind of expanding this out, so let me expand it out. So small m over big M times expanding that thing out, it's a m squared over m squared minus the uh, cross term, two times big M over small m plus the, uh, the minus one squared, one. Um, plus one from the second term there. And I factored out y, so there's y factored out. Uh, let me, now I can kind of um, distribute that factor and see what happens. Distributing it, uh, one factor of this squares get canceled this ratio gets canceled and I have a ratio of small n over big N at the very end there. So if you're doing this math in your head, you'll kind of see where I'm going with this. Um, so let me just write it out so that you can see. Uh, one fourth big M over small n minus now I have two over four, just minus one half plus um, 
small m over big M plus one and oops, oh sorry that's one fourth there so you say oh I have that one there I can combine that with this so it now becomes plus one half so all this is a kind of complicated expression on the right hand side it does get simplified a little bit into uh, one fourth big M over small m plus one half plus small m over big M times y. And I think you can actually simplify this a little bit more. You can kind of uh, refactor this back in. Um, but I guess that, that doesn't really simplify anything. So I can leave it here and just to solve this for y. Um, say that y is equal to 1 over this ugly thing. Uh, one fourth big M over M plus one half. I keep forgetting that one fourth <laughs> plus one fourth small M over big M. I guess uh, factoring out one fourth is one thing you can do, but uh, let me just leave that there. Um, so this is an expression for what we are looking for in terms of just the masses, which are given quantities. So you can plug in the numbers see what you get. Um, let me actually do that. So, so um, one of the hints, by the way, was to, did I delete that hint? I might have deleted that hint. Uh, oops. Um, one of the hints, which I shouldn't have deleted, is um, um, it gives me the masses of the things. Uh, let me so, and it gives it in such a unit that the U, unified uh, atomic mass, it uh, cancels out. So I don't even have to plug that in, uh, which is why I wanted it. Um, so let me just have that here. And then I can just plug in the numbers. Um, let me bring out my calculator here, uh, clear everything. So um, I guess uh, if I have just the ratio of the masses, I can just use that. So let me do the ratio of the small mass, 55.9345 to the large mass, 235.439. Okay, that's that ratio. I'm gonna have that stored into memory. And um, here's the ratios in straight form. Here's the reciprocal of that ratio. So the way I should plug in it is, um, so one over parenthesis four times the ratio memory recall parenthesis closed plus uh, one half or 0 0.5 plus um, the ratio. So memory recall again divided by four is equal to the number in the denominator so I take the, well, put that into memory and take the recipe called one over what was in the memory. So 0 0.62. Um, so that's the fraction. So in percent, it should be 62.11%. All right, let's uh, plug in the numbers and see. Um, I say this half jokingly and this time it could actually be true. <laughs> it could be wrong and you'll be embarrassing. Um, 62.11 percent. All right, it was right. <laughs> it wasn't as embarrassing. But um, I kind of want you to see how long and complicated this uh, algebra was. And um, I think uh, getting good at something like this only comes with the practice. And I can tell you how many times I've seen questions like this and didn't know the exact right thing to do. Like even now, I'm only 80% sure as I'm going through the path that I have myself laid out. And um, questions like this, system of equations involving square roots and squares is one where um, you might not make any mistake per se, but do things that'll lead you down a dead end. And here, I've done this many times, and I had a sixth sense for avoiding dead ends. But even then, I had to break some rules. I used an equation twice. And if I wasn't careful, I could have easily had 
uh, dependent system of equations. So, okay, I want you to go over this question, so I did, and it was a lot longer than I thought it would be. 